All right, welcome, welcome, welcome to another MLOps virtual meetup. I'm really excited for everyone to be joining. Uh, we have a really, really cool event today, and we have actually two CTOs with us, which will be pretty exciting to see. So hopefully some technical demos and some really awesome uh, treatments from both sides. So let's bring in uh, our speakers, which will be very fun. Uh, first, we have Pavel from Latticeflow, uh, and we have David from Vectorflow. So similar sounding companies, different products. Uh, I'll give each of them a few minutes right now just to introduce uh, what their products are and what they'll be showing, and then we'll jump right into the tech talks. Uh, Pavel, why don't you kick us off? Uh, hi, everybody. Happy to be here. So my name is Pavel. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Latticeflow. And today I would like to tell you more about kind of the blind spots in MI models. So essentially, as you all well know, like by now, kind of, it's not a question kind of if you are using AI, but more question of kind of how and what's the best way. And in many ways, that kind of the speed of technology has been too fast for kind of the kind of infrastructure part to catch up. And this is kind of where we come in with kind of more than 10 years on the research uh, background where we build building kind of models that are kind of certifying some of the deep learning models that we see right now and kind of are able to reason about where these models are making mistakes and not only mistakes, but kind of what are the systematic mistakes? How can we know that there are some or maybe there are none, which is great. And how can we avoid them in production? Awesome. And David? Hey everyone, uh, thanks for having me. So I'm uh, building Vectorflow. Vectorflow is um, basically it's, it's an open source vector embedding pipeline. So the idea is basically that you can bring your raw data and um, you can up you can uh, basically run different extraction, chunking, embedding, and um, upload logic to a vector DB. So you're um, able to basically take your your system to production. Um, pretty much as soon as you've figured out what set of configurations work best for you. Um, so it's it's high throughput, high reliability. It runs on Kubernetes and in uh, basically any cloud. It's cloud agnostic and it works with uh, eight different vector databases right now. So you can focus more on uh, writing your application logic and less on uh, data engineering. So I'll talk more about that in my talk. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, cool. Thanks so much. And before we get started, just a special thanks to Latticeflow for making this meetup possible. Uh, we wouldn't be able to be here without them. We wouldn't have the community uh, going as well as it did without them. So huge thanks to them. Uh, and with that, let's uh, let's jump in. So uh, Pavel's going to show us uh, Latticeflow first, and then we'll jump in and, and look at uh, Vectorflow. Perfect. Yeah. So thanks again, Ben, for the introduction. Uh, as I mentioned, so at Latticeflow, a mission is really kind of to enable and empower companies to, to build safe, trustworthy, and, and robust AI. And this really goes kind of across the, the horizontal stack. And one particular topic uh, that we've seen kind of gaining a lot of focus recently is so-called model blind spots and how this ultimately can help us build better models. So what I would like to do in kind of the first part is kind of get a bit of intuition what it is a blind spot uh, and kind of to have a better understanding what uh, we are discussing. And then in the second half, I will have three small use cases that we can show, including kind of live demo of the tool, kind of to see how this actually works uh, in practice and what are the implications. And for that, uh, let me quickly jump to another part where essentially how are kind of the ML engineers and kind of people building some of the models right now. So this is, I'm sure, very familiar picture for many of you, where essentially what would happen is that you kind of get a task, you started collecting the data, you curate it, you label it, you start training the model. And at the beginning, it might look something like this. Essentially, everybody is happy, you are improving, you kind of reach some point, maybe in this case, this is roughly 90, 91%, but then often, teams get stuck and then there can be many different reasons why uh, teams get stuck. But at some point, essentially, you might want to say, okay, from all these models that I learned, let me kind of pick the best one I had so far um, using some validation set. And then this would be essentially a candidate that you would want to bring to production. And now the kind of two quick questions that we would be asking at this point is, first of all, is this model truly better if this kind of one number that we are using, which is the aggregate accuracy is kind of higher. And the other one is, well, ultimately we seem to get stuck here. So how do we get kind of above this line? And for that kind of the way we look at the problem is uh, both from the data, but especially from the model side. So if you kind of look at the model, if we were to run 
and kind of drill down into what's actually happening. So all these points are ultimately made up of all the individual points that are in the data set. This can range from a couple of hundred to millions. And ultimately the line above is essentially a collection of mistakes the model is making. And what we would like to do is kind of look at those mistakes and kind of say, okay, if these are all the mistakes that the model is making, is there any systematic reason why the model is making mistakes? So kind of we would like to unwrap this like little ball of individual mistakes and put them in some sort of uh, groups that we could be able to reason. And there can be, again, many reasons. Could be because some of the samples are simply rare, which is natural. You have this problem of the long tail. Could be that, for example, some of the labels are incorrect, which if this is the case, there is essentially in a way very easy way to fix it. Could be because both spurious correlations, and I will show some uh, kind of later in the talk, uh, could be because the samples are ambiguous, or but the labels are ambiguous and so on. And again, kind of the main goal of this exercise is once you can get this kind of a bigger drill down into the categories, it gives you some insights uh, that helps you to fix them. So this is kind of the main idea. Now let's see how this actually looks uh, on a real data set. And for that, um, let's go in an example. So this is probably a data set that everybody knows. So this is one class from, from the ImageNet. There is a class, in this case, Bob player, and kind of one challenge here is, as I mentioned, scale. So these data sets are huge. They can have lots of mistakes. And one common way how these are evaluated is this kind of aggregate accuracy, let's say 95%. And this is the thing that uh, we are really kind of working hard to try to get beyond this aggregate accuracy because uh, even if this number can be relatively high, like in this case, 95%, uh, often there can be this kind of small systematic mistakes that are hidden behind this big number. And one example here would be, for example, in this case, you can pick individual points, you can group them. In this case, this would be, for example, all these kids uh, with this particular clause. And if you look at this subset of examples with these particular features, we we'll actually figure out the model is much, much worse than on average. And this is kind of not an uncommon thing. So we've seen this across multiple industries. For example, this is one of the common applications that we see across our clients, where you would have essentially, for example, car damage inspection, have a bunch of pictures. For example, whenever you rent a car, now you would have an application on your phone that you would just go around, you take pictures and it automatically detects damages. And there can be common spurious correlations, such as, for example, when there is a damage, people tend to point uh, at the damage. And then you would have, for example, lots of uh, fingers visible in the damage, which are essentially correlated with um, the damage, because this is very naturally for people to do, but naturally this is the wrong reason for the model to make predictions. Um, and other examples could be, often you would, might have custom hypotheses, what can go wrong, uh, based on kind of your experience with the data, your experience with the model or what the client would be reporting. And then the challenge would be, um, can we kind of get some of these hypotheses and actually systematically go across all these examples, all these big data sets and evaluate it. So in this case, this would be, for example, not only like people pointing uh, at the damages, but for example, zooming in. And like, again, if you actually do this analysis, you would go and kind of label every individual image, whether it's zoomed in or not, you would figure out that this is something that is affecting the model. The hard part is how can you do it in five minutes without kind of going and labeling everything? So this is the main idea. Let's now jump uh, into a demo that we would see kind of how this actually works on a real data set. And for this, let me kind of uh, show you uh, how the platform looks like. So for example, in this case, uh, this is a platform. This is deployed fully uh, on premise. You can kind of upload your data sets and the models. So I have already a couple of data sets that uh, I uploaded here, some of them this is, for example, the ImageNet data set that I mentioned before. Uh, and then there are already some, for example, here, this is object detection for classifying soda bottles. This is for detecting kind of defects in the textures. This is, for example, one for detecting kind of cars from aerial pictures. So if I just quickly go and open one of the images, this is, for example, how the data set looks like. These are kind of all the cars in the ground truth, you can also plug in the model. So these are, for example, the model predictions. Um, 
And if I quickly go back, uh, we also have another one that is, for example, detecting watermarks from the images. So these are now a couple of data sets. So let's look more closely at three of them. So we look more closely at the ImageNet. This is kind of the baseline in many ways. And then two of the custom ones. So one is the detection from the aerial images and one is the watermarks. Um, and I have multiple versions here. And kind of coming back to what we try to do is in these data sets, we have some aggregate performance. So for example, let's start um, with the one from the aerial images. So there is some aggregate performance that the model is achieving. So in this case, 88%. And you can see that even in some hard cases, the model is actually relatively good. So here, the solid objects are the ground truth predictions. The dashed ones are, uh, sorry, the solid ones are the ground truth, the dashed ones are the predictions. So here the model is essentially reasonably well, uh, which is also reflected in the aggregate metrics, so 88%. Now, when we talk about model blind spots, um, what we would like to do is essentially say, okay, in this 88% aggregate accuracy, is there something where the model is essentially performing significantly well? And for this, there is an automated analysis that you can run from within the tool, kind of once you integrate the data. And in this case, it turns out that indeed, there is some subset of the data set where the recall drops from 88%, which was the average case, which looked really good, to essentially down to 22% or 32% on the validation and training set, uh, respectively. So. This is quite a significant decrease. If you look at kind of what are the other samples in the data set, so it turns out that naturally it's much better than the average. So like one uh, part goes up, the other one points down. And the main important thing here is that you can also see here, we are doing kind of statistical text in the background, which are checking, um, is this kind of, this is essentially a hypothesis that we created now, kind of why there is a subset of the data that is, uh, not working well. It's not simply taking all the bad examples and putting them in one bucket, because what we want is to be able to say for new examples that are coming in that we don't have the labels for, to be able to say kind of, are they underperforming or not? And that's why it's very important to have kind of all these statistical checks on top. Uh, otherwise, it will be just generating lots of lots of hypotheses. So this is kind of one example. If we go to the other data set, so this is now ImageNet exactly the same thing happens. So if I, for example, select ambulance, I get the same thing. So here I have a subset where the model is 97% correct. And actually there is another subset where it's only 25%. And here in ImageNet, it's kind of more interpretable because the kind of the domain is, is more generic. So here, if you look at these ambulances, this is kind of the standard thing that you would imagine if I would say an ambulance. If you look at what's inside here, all weird things start happening. For example, there is a helicopter, there is like one ambulance that is very, very far away. There is this one, which is kind of not even a standard ambulance. This is some sort of uh, half SUV that has the ambulance straps on top, or this one has no open doors. So these are kind of all the things that now you can go, you can start creating and splitting them further. Um, and again, in this case, these are quite serious. If I would, for example, pick another class, I can say, for example, for the seat belts. Uh, actually, here I didn't run the analysis yet. If I run the analysis, this is relatively small data set, so this is kind of uh, quite fast. Um, we would see a similar thing. So here it goes from like 66% down to 12. And the kind of similar thing happens again on the third data set that we had. Uh, which was doing uh, watermarks. So if I look at this image, indeed, for example, here there is a watermark and this is the true label. This is also the prediction. And now um, if I look in the automated analysis that we had, we can, can again run it. So this data set is uh, quite a bit bigger. This is uh, roughly 30, 40,000 images. And this is by the way, running on my laptop as I'm presenting. So as you can imagine, uh, if you deploy this in the server, this can scale to much bigger uh, data sets. And essentially what we are doing now internally is kind of checking, okay, this is the data set. We typically have some sort of metric that can measure how good each prediction is. 
Uh, this can be the loss of the model. This can be literally is the prediction true or false. And then we are trying to find some sparse classifier that again generalizes well and has enough support that would essentially put similar mistakes together. So again, in this case, we had one subset that is 98% correct. So you can essentially say this is really good. I'm kind of happy deploying this. This is passing all the bars. Or naturally, you could even go and start improving this one. But more importantly, there is the other subset where it's essentially not working. So this is literally not uh, making any predictions. And this is just to kind of stress the importance of why kind of looking at the aggregate metrics is most of the time not telling the full story. Um, these are naturally the examples where things did get wrong. So ideally, if you work with good models, if you run a similar analysis, you would not find such bad subsets of your data. You would find something that may be slightly decreasing, but not by 90%. Um, but this is part of kind of where we want to get. Um, and now this is also kind of why this is hard and why it is important. So for example, if I go back uh, to the tool, so let's uh, go back. So this was um, actually, yes, let's, let's pick this one. So this was the one data set with the watermarks. Um, and if we, for example, look at standard embedding, so this is something that uh, you might already played with, you might seen it. So here we have two classes, we have relatively nice representation, which is coming from the model that was trained, where you can clearly see that this is, for example, the part uh, with the watermarks, and this is kind of how it looks like. This is now the part with uh, no watermarks. Again, these are kind of from scenery images, so most of these are kind of outdoor images. And if I look in this representation, and I will look at whether the predictions are correct, you can see that there are some parts, like for example, this one, where maybe you can say like there is a bit more errors, but, and also clearly like in this region up here, the model is more or less correct. So this is like 99.9% .9 correct. Uh, if I look in this region here, here it drops down to 68%. But as you can see, this is still nowhere near the 4% that we found with the analysis before. And this is really kind of a fundamental problem of the embeddings in general, where, um, it, as you might know, the embeddings are essentially a projection. It's an unsupervised projection of the original data. Uh, and that's why you might not see these kind of patterns here. Like sometimes you can see them, uh, but in general, many times this would be essentially not enough depth of the analysis that you might want to do. And this is also why kind of having the re representation is very important. Uh, in our case, we support naturally, you can plug in the models that you have. You can also plug in some foundational models and then naturally the representation changes. So for example, here you can see that the errors are even split much more evenly within the, the space uh, of the embeddings that are computed. So these are kind of some examples of what can go wrong and why some of the standard metrics and approaches are not quite enough to catch those. Um, and in the time that we that is remaining, we can kind of quickly see what can we do about some of the things. And this is where kind of the other part of the platform comes in. So, so far we purely looked at the model. We haven't really looked that much uh, in the data, uh, but what we can do is actually go through some of the kind of high level workflows that we support. Uh, for example, here, if I start one that is comparing data set splits, this is a workload that is designed to essentially see if you have multiple splits in your data set, are you leaking some data between the splits or is there any other representativeness issues in the data that you might have? So if you go here, you can see now there are highlighted some clusters that are in the red, uh, which is a metric that was computed uh, by Latticeflow. And why are these in the red? So if you select them and you actually go and, for example, select what is the split distribution, we can see that in this sample that I selected is roughly 50% training, 50% validation. And now if I look at some other cluster like this one here, um, here the distribution is roughly 67% training, 17% valid, 17% test, which is kind of the standard distribution in this data set, 
and turns out that in this region, as well as in this other region, as well as like in these other regions up here, this distribution essentially is not correct. So this is a subset of the data where essentially you literally have zero images um, that are being tested, maybe in some examples, like here, again, this is like, you have zero images that are used to test the model performance. And this is like some of the reasons that, for example, the model would not generalize well. Um, but this is only kind of one of the reasons. Um, the other reason might, for example, be that you are leaking the data, as I mentioned. So not only the data set is not representative, the kind of data that is collected is literally kind of incorrectly split. And this can often happen when the data is collected from multiple sources or from internet and so on. Uh, and again, for that, there is kind of out of the box support where, for example, in this case, I can sort by the similarity. So these are now groups of similar images that are computed automatically by the platform. And you can see now these are clearly similar. They don't have to be necessarily exactly equal, um, but they are very similar to each other. And um, with this, again, you can take this knowledge, you can quickly use it to kind of validate hypothesis. Is it affecting my training distribution? Is it affecting my test performance? Uh, where the test performance is typically the one that is very important. For example, here, I could quickly go and say, uh, let me select my test set. So this is now filtering only the images in the test set. And I can also quickly go here and I can say, okay, in the test set, let's, uh, oops, this is the wrong score. Let's only look at the images that are very, very similar to each other. And actually it turns out there is not that many, which is good. So this is actually what we would like to do. Uh, if there would be a lot of them, then this would be a problem. So there is essentially lots of leakage and duplication in the test set, uh, in the, sorry, in the training set and the validation, but not uh, in the test set, which is good. So for example, these two are kind of looking, uh, maybe I can zoom in a bit. So these are not the same. It's, or it's kind of the same image, but it's slightly rotated in the version on the right. Um, and yet these are kind of both in the test set. So kind of where does this leave us? So, um, Ultimately, it's a platform. You can kind of install it uh, similarly as you would any other platform. It kind of plugs in into the horizontal lifecycle of what the typical MLOps and data and ML engineers would do. Uh, we mostly focused uh, on the part of the ML engineers. So this is the part where we are looking at the model blind spots, model improvement, and how it affects the model. Naturally, it kind of extends to other side as well. So on one hand, the data analyst can go and kind of, once some issues are fine, curate the data, uh, fix the labeling mistakes, uh, detect which samples would be interesting to label next, as well as kind of on the business part, kind of how can we cope up with some of the more formal safety arguments that would help us deploy some of these models more safely. So these are just a couple of other examples. It, Really, it's at the level of, if you look at different data sets across the main, in different domains, including medical, including kind of satellite imagery, um, you kind of start seeing lots of lots of things when you really, once you really start looking in, into some of these issues. Um, and with that, um, if any of this is interesting, please do contact us. Uh, we are kind of um, happy to have these discussions. Uh, especially if you are kind of in the deployment and you already start facing some of these issues, but also kind of earlier on where, for example, you don't even have the labels yet. You are only collecting the data, um, but maybe you are kind of thinking what data to collect in the first place, what send to labeling and so on. So with that, thanks a lot. Uh, if there are any questions, happy to answer. That was a really fantastic presentation. Thanks so much. Um, it's, it's really cool to see um, people working on kind of finding very specific model failure modes that's definitely under worked on in the industry. So it's it's cool to see more people um, take that on. I'm curious if you guys are working with other modalities uh, outside of image classification, like object detection or anything outside of, uh, of that world. Uh, very good question. So 
as I mentioned, we've worked on these topics from the research side for more than 10 years now, actually. So if anybody is interesting, I can point people to the, the group of the research uh, where we have kind of applications to literally everything from speech to point clouds to even code, which is actually very nice because in code, you can actually really reason about many of the semantics that you, for example, don't have in language because in code, things have semantics that are executable. You can reason about, is this actually wrong or not? Um, I would say in terms of lattice flow, we are mostly focused on vision, uh, expanding now to speech and kind of looking into NLP as well, but there are kind of, there are many other problems at this point and I'll, I'm sure we will hear more in the next talk. Awesome. Yeah. Super, super cool. Um, okay, great. Yeah. So I'll save, uh, the rest of my questions for the end. And I think with that, we'll bring on David and, and take a look at vector flow. Uh, alrighty. I'm going to let you jump right in, uh, and I'll come back in at the end. Cool. Thanks, Ben. Um, so yeah, like I uh, mentioned earlier, we're working on vector flow. So, um, Really, the, the problem that Vectorflow is really trying to solve, I think, at its core is to kind of abstract away a lot of the um, non-high value add pieces involved with connecting data to um, LLMs and in, in general, AI systems. Um, so everything from like orchestrating like the Kubernetes cluster, the raw kind of like compute to uh, the message broker logic, retry, all the different things that you need in production. Uh, to actually make this thing work so that you can actually, um, you know, tinker with um, the different configurations of your system and figure out like how to actually make it perform um, as good as possible. So with that kind of in mind, I'm going to talk today about like how you actually want to ingest um, large volumes of unstructured data and um, also how you um, can perform tests to ensure that um, you're doing that ingestion uh, as effectively as possible. So let's talk first a little bit about like some of the challenges associated with ingestion. So um, there's a wide range of scenarios for in for ingesting data, right? And this is one of the challenges where you know there's hundreds of different source systems. Uh, you have to write to a variety of different target systems, um, and you know everything from um, the need to sync the data and update it to the need to work with a wide variety of file formats, each that has their own type of processing, right? So one of the things you're hearing people uh, in the industry talk a lot about is PDFs with tables, for example, like how, you know, so PDF is one type of, of file, right? And there's different ways to handle it. You can read it in as raw text. You can use OCR. A lot of um, companies built basically custom systems that use a mixture of computer vision and NLP to analyze them. Um, and a table is kind of like, you know, how would how, also, how would you read in um, like a CSV file for, um, for use in LM workflows, right? Like how would you actually chunk it? Would you put the rows together? Like, would you, would you basically concatenate everything in a row? Would you put like the column heading? There's a lot of different ways to do things. Um, and it depends a lot on like the actual use case that you want uh, to work with, like what you're actually trying to get out of the model, how precise you need the results to be. Um, and this gets even more complicated with the fact that like the file sizes can be super variable, right? Like if you have a massive file, you probably can't process it on one machine and you can't process it all at once. And uh, you go way beyond like the model's ability to understand uh, the content in the context window holistically the file. Um, and then on top of that, right, like the lack of a defined structure means that while well, you can, you know, look for certain things like keys in a JSON file, um, you're never going to know that like a specific row will always exist with, you know, a, a specific column will always exist and be a specific data type, right? The way you would have with tabular data. Um, and so these are all different problems that basically like, as you're dealing with ingestion, you have to try to figure out, um, what set of configurations and what approach do I use for my data in my use case? Um, and because these LM workflows are so new, um, there's not really any best practices yet. Um, we're seeing different things like different patterns start to emerge, but pretty much this is still happening on like a case by case basis where like how you get the data out of the file, how you choose to chunk it, um, what metadata you choose to include. Um, when you package the data and upload it to the vector DB and also um, 
what embedding model you actually choose to use. And uh, at the end of it, what LLM you actually choose to use. All, all these different things actually have a massive impact on the results potentially. Um, so this is a lot of different things, right, that you have to take into account. And if you think about like writing the logic to swap all these things out, um, and if you're dealing with any reasonable volume of data, um, you also need to orchestrate the infrastructure to do this, right? Like you need a message broker, you need a queue system, um, you need a, um, you, you need like some sort of way to orchestrate the distributed computing and you have to be able to check logs of different machines or pods. Um, and probably this is not really going to add a lot of value to uh, your end application. So um, instead of spending all that time doing stuff, um, we recommend you use a system kind of like ours um, that's basically an out-of-the-box pipeline. Um, and this will actually help you uh, experiment much, much faster because you don't have to deal with these things that are not a core part of your value proposition. Like in the semantic search, you, you want to understand how to package the data to get the best searches. Um, but when you do actually figure out that set of configurations as well, once you have a pipeline in place, um, you can pretty much just turn it on. And you don't have to have this like awkward moment where, okay, I figured out like how I want to chunk the data and how I want um, the scripts to run. But um, now I need to go figure out how to like solve all these other production uh, challenges. So this is one of the huge benefits as well. Um, Vectorflow in particular uh, takes kind of a unique approach to this where we basically have a, a set of defaults built into the pipeline. And one of the things that our um, open source community is actively adding is, is more defaults. So the ability to select from different types of chunkers, uh, different types of extraction approaches. We actually, um, under the hood, use uh, Llama Hub and can pretty much add any connector to, to basically access any data source that uh, is supported by Llama Hub. Um, so you can you can take advantage of these like built in things, but also you can override the defaults to like just basically have your own Python script run um, at scale distributed. Um, and so if that type of pipeline is uh, the right the right pipeline for your needs, then it's perfect. But there's other approaches to this problem, too, that I want to also call out. There are like end to end rag systems where you can actually just kind of um, basically do the whole search via like an API, like you upload and then you can just do the search. Um, this can also be, be a good approach as well. Um, and I think the general idea is, you know, you want to offload some of this infrastructure and productionizing responsibility. Um, and you need to experiment a lot to figure, to figure out how to actually get the best results. Um, the wide variety of data basically means that there's no silver bullet technique for best search, at least not yet. Right. So like I was talking about earlier that the PDFs with tables um, that can vary a lot by use cases, but also like, you know, what happens if you're ingesting like notion pages, for example, or it's like, you know, in, in some ways, even less clean, right. Newer, newer source of data. So, um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about how you can actually um, test these, these different techniques to understand uh, on ingestion, what would work best for you. Um, so you need like a systematic approach. And um, to, to give you a sense of my background, um, probably should have started with that. Um, so I worked for a, a little while at an LLM, um, an LLM powered legal tech company that was ingesting uh, as many as 5 million documents at a time to uh, help with uh, litigation e-discovery. And so we actually went through this approach to kind of figure out um, how we wanted to ingest our data. Um, so. Basically, we selected a subset of the data that we um, had, like basically PDFs that we had read through uh, multiple times and we understood really well um, basically what was in those PDFs. So um, we then made a set of questions. I think it was about 25 questions. Um, and we wrote out um, the answers to those questions. And then we actually used ChatGPT to um, basically evaluate the answers and decide like, is this correct or not? Um, and then we configured this, so we had a script that did this. And then, um, we then ran it multiple times and took an average score to kind of, uh, smooth out the variability of the model. Um, and you can actually do this if, 
if you test one by one with like the different variables holding everything constant except one thing like the embedding model or the chunking strategy, you actually start to get a pretty good sense of how different techniques perform um, for your data. Um, I think there are actually some frameworks out there that, that do this approach um, in the open source community. So I would, I would look into that. I think there's one I actually found it, uh, the other day. I think Ragas does something similar to this. Um, but you could also honestly just script this pretty easily. Um, the, the key things are, like I said, hold uh, basically everything except one thing constant on your ingestion. Um, you want to test on a fraction of your data. Um, I would actually recommend ingesting like um, all the data only at the end when you know what works. But you want to take in enough um, where your you can still actually test that um, the embeddings um, and the, the query system works pretty well. So you need like probably tens of thousands of vectors, I would recommend. You don't necessarily need millions, um, but you need a good amount so that you can actually understand like how the, the ANN algorithms are, are actually performing. Um, and the vector embedding pipeline will make this a lot faster and easier because basically like all you have to do with something like vector flow is go into your Python code, for example, and just change the value of one property on an object, um, and then just basically run run the embedding function again. Um, and you can do this over and over and over again um, and test the results. And we're going to be adding things to the pipeline to help with this um, as well. Um, please reach out if you are interested or if you have any questions about that. Um, yeah, so. Um, Another interesting thing uh, we've kind of observed that I wanted to talk briefly about with regards to unstructured data is like multimodal systems. So I think um, you're seeing this now with like ChatGPT, how like, you know, you can you can access now via the API, all the multimodal stuff. And um, we added image embeddings to our product pretty early. Um, some pretty cool use cases we've observed for multimodal. Um, it's like using the results um, uh, for like the, one of my favorite ones is the e-commerce one where basically uh, you can take a photo of something and you basically say like, oh, that's a, that's a cool jacket. And then it'll um, basically pull up all the similar jackets that you can possibly buy. Um, another interesting one I've heard uh, for manufacturing, like using images to detect structural defaults in, in things before they actually go out into the real world, um, like on the manufacturing line. Um, another really cool one that I saw during my time uh, in legal tech was like trying to build a chronology from your data so for example, like using different vector indexes to represent different points in time to actually like have the data construct a story, I think is um, pretty cool. And I think what's cool about uh, vector flow is you can actually try out all of these things super easily because we support um, these different uh, file types and these different um, modalities. Um, yeah, so I actually have a video. Uh, let's see if it'll run. Might be a little laggy. Hi, uh, today we're going to see how to use Vectorflow with Milvis. So you can see on the left here, the Vectorflow uh, managed service UI. We, we have Milvis as our database. And we have all of our key uh, metadata punched in, like the chunking strategy, chunk size overlap, the uh, collection name and environment. So we're going to upload a one megabyte file for embedding. Let's see how that goes. Okay, you can see it's embedding right now. It's completed. Now let's go to uh, the Zillis cloud here on the right, and we'll just refresh it. And you can see now all the data is in the vector database. So not sure how, how laggy that was or not, but basically like what the video is demonstrating is uh, at Vectorflow, we actually have like a, basically a hosted alpha, like a demo version of the product where you can upload files and, and play around with the different configurations. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it works with a variety of different vector databases. Um, Definitely test it out if you're working on um, setting up a RAG system. And yeah, here's some links if anyone's interested. Um, our open source repo, we have a, an active and growing open source community, which is really cool. We're always looking for new contributors. Um, we have this free hosted version of the product that um, we'll be upgrading in the near future. Well, you'll Right now you can upload a single file, basically play around with it, see, see what that looks like. But um, Pretty soon you'll be able on the managed service to um, actually upload uh, entire directories and uh, we may be adding a, a chat with your data functionality soon as well. Um, also a note on the managed service, um, the endpoint that you can actually use um, is publicly available uh, if you want to put it in your system, if anyone's interested in trying it out. So there's a, 
There's a collab that we'll share at the end of this presentation. Um, and if you want to try out VectorFlow programmatically, we actually have a distributed version of the product hosted with a bunch of servers spun up. It's pretty fast. It can work with a bunch of different vector DBs. So if you want to take more of a code level approach to playing around with it, that's out there as well. And we have our documentation site. Um, yeah, so that's that's my presentation. I uh, look forward to hearing everyone's questions and, and thanks for having me and thanks for your time. Awesome, cool, thanks so much. I love uh, the synergy between this and uh, Vectorflow and Latticefly. I think that's some very cool, similar names. One start, start of the pipeline, one extra step of the pipeline. Um, so that's, that's super cool. Um, thanks so much for sharing, David. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to chat about, I think, uh, something we were all chatting offline before this started and, and seems particularly kind of relevant, especially with the idea of large language models and embeddings and multimodal systems. I'm curious if either of you have worked with your team or thought um, about specific parts of, for example, in the US, uh, the AI bill that has come out. Um, have that Has that affected you at all? Have you guys been thinking about that and, and making any product changes or considerations there? Uh, interesting question. Yeah, this has been all, all over the news like for, for last week. Uh, I think for us, um, we, given our background uh, where we literally started with certification of some of the models, we, we actually have contributed some of the, to some of the standards coming from ISO and similar ones uh, for checking some of the things. And I think um, in that sense, it's, it's kind of exciting to see that there is kind of a wider awareness of some of the issues uh, that are coming in. I would say there is still more work that needs to be done on kind of concretizing some of the things because many of these kind of discussions are very high level. It's similar with the AI Act in the Europe where, for example, it line, outlines some of the best practices. Um, kind of the system should be accessed uh, and should be evaluated properly, should be read team and so on. But um, David, you can also say more like when, when people evaluate, for example, language model, like even the evaluation itself is an open problem essentially in, in, in that community. So in, in vision, it's a bit easier or in some other domains, but like in some other ones, like even how they even evaluate the model, if like and every retraining, essentially all the predictions and all the ground through changes, uh, it's an open problem. But uh, for our side, we are definitely kind of, we see kind of a natural extension of what we are working on because ultimately some of these things like uh, absence of blind spots will be natural part of the technical assessment that, that can be done in the future. Yeah, I, I think for us, like, because we are, you know, really like an ingestion pipeline, we, like the core effects to the models, I think we, we are somewhat model agnostic and I think that's part of the advantage of our system but I think anything that could potentially make using LLMs in production or any AI system really more durable in the long run helps us. I think um, something probably a lot of people in the tooling space are seeing is um, limited movement to production um, with some of these applications due to some of the issues that I think regulations are trying to address, things like biases or uh, hallucinations, anything that would potentially make a model less uh, reliable in production and usable uh, for the general public. So I think like in the long run, it could definitely help with the the durability of our space. I think, um, so we're based in the United States, uh, Vectorflow. And I think also for us, like we were pretty excited to hear that um, there's some attention to uh, helping bring more AI talent to the United States was, was something that we were particularly excited about. Um, I went to grad school in Europe and my uh, co-founder is from Europe. And um, we know a lot of people all over the world that, that really want to work in this space. And I think um, that will accelerate the, the exchange of knowledge. And so we were very pleased to hear about that. That's awesome. And, and I'm curious how both of you think about it, both generally, but also in, within the perspective of, of your tools. Um, like David, you were saying uh, Vectorflow is model agnostic. How do you both think about uh, open source versus closed source models within your system um, in terms of support? and kind of moving forward uh, with the difference of just like being able, for example, to introspect embeddings and introspect different types of things that you might not be able to get from closed source models. I, I think it's, it's a very interesting question. And, and I think it's, it's also one of the good consequences of the debate about the regulations where like uh, before people were like, oh, let's stop the development because things are dangerous. And now actually I think much better way to approach this is kind of 
uh, have a way to go more open source, especially with some of these large language models, because then like lots of people can start looking, can start poking around, can start finding mistakes. And as long as there is a process to kind of report these issues and, and kind of not, it's, it's almost like the security checklist for the, which is very standard for software engineering. And the same initiative is actually some also coming from the research group at ETH, uh, where this, these are being essentially developed open source, where like whenever you find a vulnerability, whenever you find a new attack on like, let's say ChatGPT, you now have a way to go and report it. But of course this can happen only if things are in uh, open source or doesn't necessarily have to be open source, but some part has to be available for people to try it out. Yeah, I think from our perspective, so we like, our system kind of treats them both as, we try to treat them both as, both as first class citizens. I think um, the I think there's a lot of potential in, in these open source models that is yet to be explored. And so perhaps like on some of the bigger closed source models, adding transparency or and anything that that um, makes it makes them um, this, this is for lack of a better way of saying it like anything that I think makes people more open to trying the open source stuff as an alternative I think is actually a really positive development for the community like when I was working in legal tech we actually found that we got much better results using our open source embeddings uh, model that we that we use from Hugging Face. Um, but actually in our work with Vectorflow, we find that most people still want to use um, closed source models. Like, um, for example, uh, OpenAI, right, is the most popular one. And I think um, you'll see people lock into stacks is kind of what we're observing where someone says, okay, we're already on Azure. We want to we want to lock in with this. Or, um, you know, they'll pick OpenAI because it's the easiest and or the cheapest for them. And then they'll kind of build their stack around that. But I think... Um, I think anything that basically increases the the amount of overall knowledge about how these systems work and uh, techniques for mitigating risks, I think will be a positive development for the community. And I hope something like Vectorflow makes it easier for people to experiment with those models more rapidly and makes them more usable. Yeah, I'm curious if, you know, I, I think in the open source world, hugging base, we're getting like a new state of the art, state of the art model every like four, four days. Uh, I think the best one I've seen right now is is maybe Zephyr, but I think that a lot of them are winning on benchmarks that are maybe real world and may, maybe not real world. And I'm curious with with you both providing a tool a tool chain to actually put things into production. Are you seeing people adopt the open source models and seeing success with those smaller opens? Like, have you seen customers put seven billion parameter models into production using your tools? Um, and, and seen success with them? Yes and no. I would say this, especially when talking about language modules, like the space is moving so fast. I would say many of the companies are still in the R&D phase uh, or kind of kind of low risk applications uh, where it's kind of about, about productivity. And then the main thing that they start hitting uh, beyond like all these other problems we mentioned is kind of maintenance. Like I have the proof of concept, I kind of, maybe it's working on this version, but like, is it going to work tomorrow uh, on the next model or am I kind of locked in the version and now to update to a new version, I would have to like redo the whole development process again. And this is really a big challenge. So I think for us, like what we're seeing is, um, so most people just want to use what's what's easy. Um, and I think that over time, like some, some chunk, right, of, of users will always do this but i think over time as it becomes more approachable to experiment with different things and as some of the techniques solidify around like what what's good practice what's a good practice for ingesting data for this use case with an llm um, i think we'll see actually more people using open source models because i think in certain scenarios they'll be better i think as the tooling evolves around like fine tuning them for example also um that we'll see more usage of that. What we're seeing right now in terms of our user data is like a smaller percent, like fluctuates between 10 and 20, like try out uh, like open source embeddings models and play around with it and kind of see like, oh, is is this useful for me? Um, but when they actually want to like make a system go live, it seems like um, right now uh, OpenAI is definitely the preferred one. But um, I think also with regards to like privacy and security, you'll see 
uh, more and more people want to use open source models, especially like as it becomes clear, like, you know, that a specific model, um, like BGE, for example, becomes like, you know, the best general open source model. Um, and it's very clear, like, this is how you would run this and this is how you would fine tune it and things like that. Um, that that will be adopted largely for security reasons, for compliance reasons. Um, and when we have heard people using them, that is actually uh, more than performance. That's actually the principal driver is that uh, someone has like a requirement from a client or needs to comply with a particular law and basically says, well, you know, OpenAI doesn't work for this or like I'm, I'm not on Azure or, or I could be on Azure, but this is so expensive. I'd rather just provision the hardware. I'm going to be embedding stuff all the time. Uh, makes sense to have a few GPUs and just um, basically run the models myself. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how and when that transition transition happens. I mean, OpenAI announced right th 3x cheaper GPT-4 version, so that's kind of exciting. But yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see at scale when when that crossover happens and when uh, when people really begin to switch over. I think I generally agree. I think people will over time switch over to something that they can control and own and not have to worry about APIs changing and things like that. Yeah, I think, I mean, maybe this is a bit more specific to Europe, but uh, because of the language itself. So, for example, in Europe, there are lots of large initiatives for building like kind of country specific versions that are open source and can be controlled and so on. So there was one announced in, in Netherlands last week. There is another one coming up in Switzerland and so on. So, and it, it has both things. Like one is there is a need because like, the language is specific and you kind of want to fine tune it, but it's also this kind of governance aspect of it. Like can we essentially have the control over what's going to happen and then have other people plug in and almost like this is the approved version uh, to be used. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. I think there's definitely a lot of, not just that, but, but, but there's a lot of uh, country specific stuff that's coming out right now. Like even uh, I'd be curious to see the distributions of the data sets in terms of not just the language, but the dialect of that language and, and, and where those things are coming from. So I think over time, that'll also be, I think, more easily addressed in the open source community, uh, just because there's so many more people pushing and, and having specific data sets and languages that they're kind of looking for in, in, in their use cases. Um, well, cool. I think actually we're, we're just coming up on time. I'm curious as a final question for, for both of you, if there's any one important critical takeaway that, that you want people to walk away from this with, what would that be? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> David, would you like to go first? Yeah, I, I, I can do that. I think like for me, the, the takeaway that I've seen building Vectorflow and just talking to people over and over and over again, um, the big thing right now is RAG, right? People are trying to figure out different ways to do that. And I think a question for us at the beginning was, can we find a, a one size fits all approach to RAG? And, the, and so far for us, the big takeaway is no, it, you have to actually experiment with this if you want good results, you need to try out a lot of different things. And that basically motivates our core belief around why we're building Vectorflow that like, we want to give you a way to test things as easily as possible and put as many LM applications into production as possible by abstracting away a lot of this infrastructure and data engineering stuff. Um, but yeah, just this idea that you're going to have to test stuff. You're going to have to try a lot of different strategies. Um, and that you shouldn't reinvent the wheel. So even for us, we, um, you know, rather than build a million connectors, like we use Llama hub under the hood. Right. And, you know, we also recommend them for doing the search aspect of the pipeline, um, using Llama index to try out the different techniques. So I would say, um, yeah, this is a big kind of takeaway. It's very experimental, but, um, I think collectively the community as a whole will also come up with, um, best practices. And so I'm super excited and optimistic about that and really look forward to to learning more about um how to make good rag systems with um particular types of data use cases i'm also excited to see rag develop and mature as a as a, as a sector of this of this LLM world yeah and for me i think it would be the the part about now kind of everybody's running as fast as possible to kind of get the latest model released four days ago and I think it's very important to kind of build the, the common foundation on, on top of kind of which everybody can build and, and it would allow us to make systematic progress. And there is kind of, there are some big companies in the world that have like 
teams of thousands of people building these things and maybe they have it internally, but there is the question like, what about everybody else essentially, uh, where we don't have resources to build it individually and this is where kind of some collaboration would be required. Yeah, absolutely. And I think from both of your talks and products, as well as I think the general uh, domain that we're playing in, there is a lot more emphasis necessary on the data that's going into these systems. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you both so much for coming on. This was fantastic. Uh, really, really informative. And I'm excited to put this up on uh, stream and have everybody kind of share their thoughts. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you.